my note takers are here. Yes, Rob, we're yes, here. We're here. Good. Do we have the, the topic of today? The same that we've been doing, yes? Other people's Don't feelings? Don't hurt my feelings. It's dangerous. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It is dangerous. I'm sure. It is. Actually, I want to start from something that happened in the office of the stipeler. The father of Rav Chaim Kanievsky. And he was mamash, like a lion. He was big, huge, and his voice was... He was a boy that went out a few times with a girl. And now Otto told that just about to, to propose and to get engaged. As we all know, everybody Pitom have a fear of the last moment. Am I doing the right thing? I'm not doing the right thing. Maybe I can find something better. All the nine yards that we know about. Eh? He said, okay, I know in the yeshiva, they, they told me, but he said, uh, something is bothering me inside. I cannot get rid of it. So he went to consult with the stipler what to do. Here is what he told him. It's not uh, something that Pitom, you find out that she is on pills or she is anorexic or maybe have health issues. That's not what, it, what we're talking about. You saw it when you went out. You saw it and anyway, you wanted to continue. So it means it doesn't bother you so much because if it did, you will not go out anymore. So he told them, let me tell you, if you were my son, I'll tell you ad advice that I will tell my own son. I will tell my own son, don't pay attention to it. And I'll tell you why. Maybe there's something that, that bothering you. It will take a toll on you, your life 5%. very possible that the character that, that, that you see now that is problematic is going to make us from time to time frictions between you two. See how he talks to him. He'll lay everything on the table. But he said, my advice to you there is a different side to the coin. If you're gonna now say, I don't want the Shidduch anymore, you're hurting the girl in such a way that she might want forgive you all her life. And then he said, all your life will be full of problems. You will not gonna see one day. Maybe you're gonna get married to a girl more than her. 
But these problems, this pain that you caused her, we're going to chase you all your life. We, in doubt, we don't know if this will be an issue after you'll get married. And let's say for argument's sake, it will. You have to know, he said, it's a very minor suffering against the huge amount of suffering that will come on you if you're going to hurt her now. Why? He told them because when a person feel pain, it most likely will be on the person very much throughout suffering. That's what the stipler told him. If you decided to continue, if you saw that is not, you cannot manage with that. So he said, no, after second day, bye. But you are dragged there to seven, eight, nine. This is already close to the end. Now you walked up. And she will get hurt on Oiva Voy. It will cost you. People, you know, I don't know why is it, but we think that words, it's only words. But if you learn Torah, the Torah will, will tell you Israel, the Jewish nation, the, the, the Koach, the strength is in their mouth. We can create world and we can destroy world with our mouth. There is a place in Eretz Israel called Netivot. The Babasali used to live there. There is a high school by a name Oel Chaya, the tent of Chaya. And they came out with a story that they were asked to publicize it in all the high schools and all the schools, the Haredim in Eretz Israel. And I think that the teachers over here and the students, if there are, you should pay very, very close attention. The <laughs> the helper to the principal, she had a daughter that she got married a little bit in a later age. And she didn't have kids. No matter what she tries, doesn't work. So there is a hospital in Eretz Israel called Soroka. I think it's in Be'er Sheva. And she going through tests to see if the ovaries are okay and so on, you know, if Bechlal she's able to bring kids to, to, to the world. So now they need three days in order to get an answer.
So in three days, she might find out that she is not going to be able to bring kids to the world. It means, it means a divorce. And she will never have kids because the, the husband, he wants kids. No. I don't have to tell you how the three days were passing. While she is laying on a bed in the hospital, she reminded herself that in eighth grade, they brought a substitute because the teacher gave birth and she went to vacation so now they have to bring a substitute and the substitute was not so experienced and his eighth grade do i have to tell you what eighth grade is huh definitely not easy <laughs> everybody was accepted already to seminary they finish the test. Now, you know, they want to chill out, as we say. And they have no fear anymore. And they didn't relate to the teacher. They made a joke out of her because she sent vibes of hesitance And the girls, the eighth grader, continued to mamash touch her. Until one day she said, stop bothering me already. I can't take it anymore. And they laughed. They were laughing at her face. This girl that lay in the hospital, she was not among the seven girls that were terrorist youth. She was uh, part one. Most of the class, they kept quiet. Only seven girls were the the tzaddikot, and they gave her a very tough time. So now you think if you sit quiet, it will go just like that? When you see that the kids in the class giving tough time to the teacher, the, well, the student had to say, maybe you can stop this nonsense already. We want to learn. They have to jump on him, so they will stop. Nobody said anything. They let it go. So now she said, oh, probably she is upset. And that's what causing me to be in the hospital. I'm not able to bring kids to the world. We have to find this substitute somehow. Finally, she found her well. Not in Netivot. In Jerusalem, in a different city, she found her. She gets on the phone, and the Ima saying to the Mora, my daughter, she is in a bad shape. All her future is on the line. And she reminded herself what happened 
to you with the classmates on, on eighth grade. My daughter asking your mechila, and we want you to say over the phone three times, Ani Mochelet Lemiriam Batrina. That was the name. It was quiet. And the lady from the other side, she said, okay, I am Mohel Belev Shalem with, with a full heart. Dry. And she hung up the phone. One minute passed, the telephone rang again. Who is on the phone? The teacher. And she's saying to the mother, I don't see any reason to lie to you. What is that I will never forgive this class. Never, ever. <laughs> they destroyed my life. I almost got divorced from my husband because of them. I wanted to get a job as a teacher in the South. Nobody wanted to hire me because of my failure with this classroom. Uh, so I moved to Jerusalem and I was trying to open a new page in my life. But they also called back to where I used to teach and they got a very bad report. I said, I left the teaching, I did something else, I was not successful. We didn't have money in the house. And I had many fights, many arguments with my husband because we had no money. All these years, I was thinking about this class that destroyed my life. And especially the seven terrorist youths that destroyed my life. I will never forgive them. Not in this world and not in that world. Look how much she was hurt. And she hung up the phone. The mother looking at the daughter, the daughter, the daughter looking at the mother, what are we going to do? She is so upset. The daughter says, Ima, I will talk to her. Four hours, she was begging her. She was whining, crying. And she repeated herself, please forgive me, please forgive me. I was a teenager, I was, I was a fool. And the teacher says, I wouldn't want to forgive you, yes. But you have to understand me, I can't. Do you hear? You have to understand me. I cannot. The wounds are too deep. Many people feel like that. Are we aware of it? But Rav, how do people come to this realization? It's what like so mean? it's so random for her to think of that. <clears throat> eighth grade substitute like we've gone through so many experiences in our life how can we possibly pinpoint what it can be that's causing some sort of suffering or some sort of punishment like any past mistakes we make so many unfortunately 
And so most probably from the Shamayim, they send her an email and say, that's the problem. We have to fix it. Right. But you have to understand many people feeling like that. They want to forgive, they can't. The scar is too, too deep. It's easy to talk, to say, you know what? Uh, you know, you have to be, you have to be mochel, besoleach, don't hold a grudges and so on. But sometimes, you know, it's, it's already quite too many wounds. And they understand that the other side suffering now. They understand it and they don't want it. They want to forgive, but they can't. Why they cannot? Because until now it's hurting them like it was yesterday. They feel like you took a knife and you cut it and you cutting, as we say, Babasar Chai in the in in the live body. And she continued, the teacher, you killed me. You girls, you killed me. Day after day, you took a knife and you sticked it in my, in my veins. Not only you stick, you turn the knife left and right. How can I forgive you? I understand that you're in trouble. I understand. I understand that you're afraid to get a divorce and now you're not going to have a child all your life. I understand. And I promise you I'll make any effort to take this out of my system. And you have to remember, she was not from the seven girls that made all the troubles. She was from the quiet one. They did not protest. So imagine what, what happened to the seven ones. But what was the claim against her? You see the killing person in front of your eyes. How can you keep quiet? But as a teenager, Rav, it's not, it's also very difficult when there's a team of girls who are powerful and she, they probably felt they're going to be defeated and then they'll be the next victims. So in a way, I don't feel like... So let me tell you something. If the message in the house will be Chas shalom if I hear somebody hurted somebody else. I will not be able to take it. And you have to emphasize it time after time, time after time, and make, bring up stories and what happened in the Torah and so on. The kids at the end, they'll know that to hurt a person is a big deal. But what they see now, Ava calling Ima names. She is not sitting quietly and she returning artillery, right? Yes. So how our kids will be sensitive? Even told us they're not sensitive. They can hurt the parents and they don't care. Where is it coming from? The boundaries in the house were not set up right. Homework is important, to eat is important, take a shower is important, 
And uh, to have a clean clothing is important. To, to wear a coat and a sweater outside, extremely important. Yeah? But that's not what will make you a person. So the, the claim against this lady that laying in the hospital was, why didn't you knock on the table and say, can you stop this already? You murderers, you bunch of murderers, stop it. Meaning they were agreeing with silence. So now, let me ask you something. Because she is a teacher, you have the right to abuse her? They have no right to abuse anyone. They just... Especially a teacher that coming to teach you, doing you a favor. She prepared and she coming to say a class for you to be a match. That's the thank you. Where are the parents? Where are they? Many times I'm saying to the students, when you're talking in class, it bothering the teacher. Imagine somebody will come to the store and he will start to sing in the ear of the gossip. Are you normal? Or it the grocer will call the police and, and will take him out of here. So the teacher is coming to teach. Not enough that they're bothering her to do her job. If I was the parent, did you bother the teacher? You making such a sin, such a sin that the whole world just going to collapse now. Once I said to, to a class of a bunch of judges, I told them, imagine your father is the teacher and somebody else will do it to your father. Are you gonna sit quiet? Huh? No, not at all. You're going to chop his head off. So why are you doing it to other Abba that have child? Why are you doing it? You cool and you mean. The parents should not let it happen. When we were like you, they shivo then, what is shivo they were? We give so much respect to older people, you know, to their being. The principle we have, we, I remember used to shiver in our pants, we used to shiver.
the Rebbe will tell us something and we'll say no? My parents always told us, if we're going to hear over here one bad word, we're not going to take it. We're not going to take it. And we lived in the midst of the midst of the impurity. Better Aviv two blocks away from the beach. Could you imagine? We never said bad words. I, I told you once, a, a friend of mine got on my nerves. I told him, you tame, you, you impure. Oh, you oh, you oh, you oh, you oh. What did I say? You're not pure. They call my parents. My parents came to the yeshiva. What's going on? How come your son saying something like that? Alevai, they should see it now. Alevai, they should say it now, no? So now, with the conversation, the Mora was asking the girl that lay in the bed in the hospital, what happened to the seven terrorist youth? So she was asking them who, whom they were. And every name she said, the Mora, the face of the of the lady turned pale and pale. She almost fainted. From all the seven, six of them had no one day of life. Few of them got sick with the sickness. One got a divorce in a bad situation. One got hurt in an in accident. She became a handicap. And one went to draggy. So, I'm the seventh one, the seventh one, nothing happened to her. She got married in the age 19 and she had already four kids. And they were, and they were asking her, how come nothing happened to her? So she said, she was the quicker one to get herself into her hand. And she came to me, she said, Mora, Bemet, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So every day she came to my house with a gift, every day. Please forgive me, forgive me. He said, Her, I was able to forgive. So she was the only one to come out of all this clean. All the rest.
So now they're looking for advice, what to do, we can take it out of your system. We want to, so they decided every Friday before Shabbat, both of them will get on the phone <clears throat> and they will talk and each, they will help each other. We call it self-therapy, yeah. And slowly, slowly to take it out. We are in touch and we care for you. At the end, she got the results and the results were very, very good. And she got pregnant and now she have a Hashem three kids of her own. So we always know how to cry after. We are experts in this. To all the parents over here, I have an advice for you. Maybe you should, we should teach ourselves to cry before. So we will not come to such an extent. How many times husband and wife hurting each other? Can we count it? Can we count it? Sometimes too many to count, Rev. So you think it will go just like that? There'll be a consequence. And people hurting the other side and the excuses, he deserve it, she deserve it, what? You know what? I'll give you advice. If the spouse have issues by the way that he talk, you send a statement. When you learn how to talk, we will talk. Until then, I think we're just causing damage to ourselves. And Zeu, you don't answer back anymore. This kind of talking is not for me. Can we do it? Yeah. yeah. We have to in order to save and not cause pain to each other. Oh. I can't hear you. We have to do it. Otherwise, it's going to cause more pain. And later on, the generations will suffer. We're just thinking of the moment. We're not thinking of the future, of what pain is going to cause. I don't think the girls, when they were behaving that way, meant or thought that, oh, okay, later on, we're going to get hurt, like, it's going to come back to us. I don't think people think that way. We just react on emotion. Because that's what we have to teach. hundred percent. This is more important than math and science and all this, I don't know what. Rav, we have to have it first before we could teach it to our kids. You always say that, Rav. Yes. 
We have to have it first. We can't teach them and do it dif behave differently. So what do we want from our kids if we are not up to par? Yes, I'm it. You know, in 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 Europe, was a big Talmud Chacham. His name was Rabbi Yonatan Ibishitz. Every time they had an argument with the priests, they called him up. He will shut their mouths in two minutes. He was brilliant. His younger son somehow got off the derech. His father was devastated. How of the derech he was just about to marry an Jew. Could you imagine? Rabbi Yonatan Ibishitz, you know who he was? As a giant. I cannot even describe it. That his son will marry a goite. It was so bad that in the Shaman they give permission to Rabbi Yonatan after he passed away to come to the house of the son. His name was Wolf. Zev, yeah? They called him Wolf. Wolf Ibishitz. He get home, Pete Tom, his father sitting on the couch. Like he's alive. His father passed away a few years ago. But he came with the beard, everything else. He told them, if you think that you are gonna marry her, it's not gonna happen. I came to warn you. And psh, disappeared. The, the, the son didn't know what to do. Uh, he said, okay, maybe I have uh, illusions. Next day again, he walks home, his father is on the couch. You told them this is a second warning. Next time, if you make me come, I'm going to take you with me. That's not going to happen. The son already knew that his father means business. In the Shamaim, he have a big credit. <laughs> <clears throat> so he decided he's doing shuva. He packed up in the middle of the night and disappeared from England. He used to live in England. He had, they called him Sir, Sir. And then he got, he got the Zer, Lord. Lord Wolf. He ran away to Europe, to Poland, where his father used to live. And he did a tshuva, a mother tshuva. Bah! One day, a family 
that going on the way to a different city, it's a father, the Hatan, and the father-in-law, right? Going to the place of the Kalana because there is engagement. So they are looking for a place to stay. So they did it. So they told them the son of Rabbi Yonatan Ibishitz is here. They said, okay, we'll stay there. But they knew the past. So they decided not to eat. Meaning they didn't accept his teshuvah. You're not good enough for us. We don't trust you. So they said to him, we're not hungry. We, we're just going to drink uh, tea. and the, uh, He got very hurt. He knew why they don't want to eat. He knew it. And the end was not a nice one. First, the first Mechutan passed away. Few months later, the other one passed away. And few months later, the Hatan himself was only 20 years old. He passed away also. All three of them, they were in the house, right? You can see it almost in, in any book. It's something that we met, we don't have it in our system. The brother-in-law of Rab Chaim Kanievsky. His name is Yitzchak Zilberstein. They married to two sisters. He is saying a story that happened in Eretz Israel. It was a girl that she got a little bit She was uh, a little bit disturbed emotionally. A little bit, not too much. But the girls in the class, they had no mercy. They used to laugh at her. They used to tell, here is the Meshugat coming. Here is the mental case coming. She got hurt very much. And she said to her friends, you're hurting me. It's not fair what you're doing. Please, I'm asking you to stop it. It didn't stop. I don't know how come Haredi girls doing something like that and where is the yeshiva? Where is the, the people who are responsible? Where are they? The Rav is asking, where is the teachers? Where is the principal? What's going on over here? Why don't let something like this go by? So they said maybe it was in the break time or after the classes and the situation of the girl got worse and worse and worse she was begging him please stop 
they didn't. One day she didn't come to school. The teacher came in and she said, I have bad news to tell you. She collapsed and they took her to a mental home. Now she is totally out. And the doctor said she will never be able to get out of the hospital. She's going to have to finish her life in the hospital. What kids can do, huh? Now the classmates, they got out of themselves and said, why, why, why? What did we do? What did we do? Now she, they cannot even ask for her mechila because she, she is not here anymore. She lost it. So they sent a letter to Rav Eliashiv. Allah wa shalom, Rav Eliashiv. And they were asking him the question and Rav Eliashiv says, Oy vai, there's nothing that we can do. Whoever hurt her have to wait now until she'll pass away and then go to the grave, take 10 men and everybody should ask Mechila for her. So the messenger asking Rav Eliashiv why we cannot do it now, why we have to wait until she will go to Olam Ahmed. So he said, as long as then the neshama is in the goof in the body, Then you have to divide when the neshama is in the body and when the neshama is out of the body. But when, when, when the neshama is with the body, you're not able because it doesn't work. But when the neshama will go out, then everything will be so clear. Then they must go to the grave and ask for Mechila. So now they didn't know if they will have a chance, Mechila, to ask for her Mechila. What will be if somebody will pass away before this girl? Who knows what's going to happen? So the only thing that we can say to these girls, you should have think about it before. We all have to adapt this. Rob, what happened at the end? What? What happened to, at the end? Did, did they ever ask her by the gravesite or? They're going to, well, most probably they still waiting. So what if a person who did get hurt, Rob? And ah. what if a person who did get hurt? And they forgive the person in their heart, but the person never asked them for mechila. Are they still forgiven or not? Yeah. That's, and that's a gvua, mamash. And the same Rav saying that a, a lady walk into his office, she's crying her heart out. He said, I couldn't calm her down. She couldn't even say one word. 
Then she started to talk and she said, in the place that I work, there is five ladies who is taking my kishkes out. They hurting me left and right. He said, if I want to describe it to the Rav, it will take a long time. They saying things which is a lie and they try to give her such a hard time. Embarrassed her in public. He said, I had the life of Maro, Maro, bitter, bitter. And she's saying to the Rav, I didn't say anything. I didn't answer back. They hurted me. I kept quiet. They laughed at me. I didn't say one word. They embarrassed me publicly. I put water in my mouth. I didn't answer back because I wanted to be from the people who get hurt, but they're not returning. And what happened at the end? Listen to this. Hashem came and he collected the bill. All the five ladies that hurted her, all of them got cancer. Not even one was free of sickness. And now they sending her all kind of messenger, please forgive us. We know it's because of this Hashem is punishing us. But she is saying to the Rav, what can I tell you? If I'll spill out of my mouth the word I forgive, is not going to be with a full heart. That's what happened. When we're doing things without Heshbon. A person think that he can say and, and, and do whatever he wants. Especially if it's a husband and wife. Uh, Hashem is not forgetting anything. And the biggest problem is that sometimes a person bring himself into such a point to a situation that there is no way back. We cannot fix it anymore. And even if he wants to do tshuva and to ask Mechila what he did, and to pay any amount, just the other one should forgive him. The one who got hurt, he said, I can't. I can't. It was too much for me. I'm, I hurt. There's no one vein or there is one bone that didn't get hurt. And sometimes you didn't mean to hurt. I said something without thinking twice. And I said, it was a joke. Why did you get so seriously? For him is a joke. For the other person, it's not a joke. Why? Every person is a different neshama. Everybody has sensitivity that the other one don't have. 
not everybody is the same. No. Each one is very fragile in a different way. And you will never know if your friend will get hurt from your jokes. So, the answer is, you should not hurt. Even not in a funny way, as a joke. If you want to joke, joke on yourself. Why you have to make jokes on somebody else? Kodav, can I ask a question? Yes, Rina. What happens if you do your best not to offend someone else, but that person still gets offended? Like you're walking on eggshells and somehow it's like no matter what you do, that person still gets offended. From, from your words or from your action? from the actions or from words from other kids like from the kids or something like that you know it's some people are extremely sensitive and no matter what you do it still offends them somehow you, you say okay in this case you have to stay away because you are in a lose-lose situation but if you stay away, they also get offended. Harab, <laughs> Harab, I have that with uh, one of the uh, caretakers for my mother. I, I have to choose every single word that I say when I give, really when I give her uh, uh, chores or whatever. And she says, why, wasn't it good? I said, no, I just asked you. I think that it has to do with their black, she's black and we're Jewish and have more status in her eyes. And I treat them so great. It's very, it's a challenge every day. <laughs> Four years they work for my mother. Yes, you have to be very careful. Now, very careful. Now. What happened to the donkey of Bilam after she spoke to him? She died. Why did he die? She couldn't take it anymore. I mean, she just, no. Did the donkey see the angel of death? Her mission was complete. Why Hashem took away the donkey? Listen to this, Obatai. Listen to this. Bilan was such a rasha. Mother rasha. What? Hashem says, after all, he is the person. And if the donkey will stay alive, it will be embarrassed all his life. That a donkey spoke to him and he couldn't get what the, he couldn't see what the donkey saw. He is a rasha, let him have it. Imagine the donkey will be alive until now. And they're gonna put him in the in the special special exhibit. Huh? What a kiddush Hashem, yes? But it would bring embarrassment to him. And the donkey will speak. You're gonna ask the donkey, how are you? He will answer back, Baruch Hashem. What the Kiddush Hashem, yes? Hashem says no. No. Even Bilam, I don't want him to get hurt. Now, 
Now, you remember once we spoke about it? Huh? When you under the chupa, with you new bride, yes? Who is making the brachot? The Sheva Brachot Rav, under the chupa, different uh, rabbis. Why? So that no one should be embarrassed if they weren't chosen? No. The Chatan himself have to say it. I don't get married. I never knew that. <laughs> he has to say it because he has to live with her, with her. So why don't he say it? Huh? Why we bring other people to say it for him? So he shouldn't be embarrassed if he's too nervous to say it. Huh? Not every chatan knows how to read. Um, some do and some not. So if you're going to a wedding, you see the Khatan saying the brachot. <laughs> Next week, you're going to another wedding and you see the Khatan don't know even how to open up his mouth. He will be embarrassed and his parents will be embarrassed. So our sage says the Khatan will never say the brachot. Other people, he knows how to read. He doesn't know how to read the Why we have a bal koire, bal koire, yes? The one that reads for the congregant in the shul Yes. Because maybe some people can't read? Absolutely. Some people are not able to read. So we don't want them to be embarrassed. So now, imagine I'm going up to the Torah, okay? I'm going up. I know how, how to read, yes? So maybe I'll say to the bar, take a break, you know? I want to read my own Aliyah. The Tureza Av says no. Even the Rav should not read. Let the Bar Kore read. Why? Not to embarrass other people that don't know how to read. This is our Torah. This is what we have to emphasize on at home. And when the child you see that he is not sensitive, the whole world you came in. You and your husband, you make such a scene. Instead of crying in the Indiski movies, instead of crying in the Turkish music, or Iranian movies and so on. When your child is not sensitive, you take the tea leaf, you start to cry, say tea leaf, you say, what's gonna be with my son? This is gonna stay with him? Forever it will stay with him. So I think it's about time to put the right boundaries at home. And we're not going to tolerate hurting feelings of the other person, no matter what. Have a good night, everybody. Thank you, Rav. It was nice talking to you as usual. Thank you, Rabbi, for a very good sure. Yes, I'll Rav. see you tomorrow at one o'clock. Thank you. Thank you. My Gemara so class. My Gemara class tomorrow, 7 15. And then the 
Allah class at 9.15. Good. Well, we're you're keeping you busy. Good, Rabbi. Thank you. Have Thank a good night. Hashem. 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 Yes. Thank, Thank you. you. Really Thank quickly, you, who was the rabbi Thank who you. gave the girl who was ill? Um, the they told her to go for the funeral to ask for forgiveness. Who was that rabbi? Was it Rabbi Silverstein? Yeah. I'm sorry. Thank you, Rabbi. Thank you. Without a question. Yeah. Is there any way for us to protect ourselves from people that are extremely sensitive? Stay away. <laughs> That's the only way. Sometimes okay. they're so close we can't stay away. Yeah. And family member, family members, because, or coworkers. Because no matter what you're gonna do, you know. Probably gonna be on Zoom tomorrow. Or you coming through? No, no. I'm gonna I'm gonna be on, on Zoom. Oh. Good night, Rabbi. Thank you so much. Good night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night.